right, good day class. Um, this is Professor Cherry Rose Kocha and I'll discuss this uh, on this session an introduction to artificial intelligence. Um, the following topics that we will touch on this session are what is artificial intelligence, fields and applications, AI techniques, defining agents, type of agents, and describing environments, um, environments observability, number of agents and environments, certainty in a non-environment, and environment's behavior. And lastly, uh, we will have an exercise describing an agent and an environment. So to start with, I'll, I'm using What is Artificial Intelligence by Jamie Campbell. So in this video, I'll answer the question, what is artificial intelligence? Um, an important part of learning about artificial intelligence is understanding what the term AI means. At face value, the term artificial intelligence or AI is seem pretty straightforward, but as you drill down into its meaning, its nuances, and perhaps most importantly, what it means to different people, you will realize that AI is a broad term and even a broader discipline with many different meanings. To begin with, there are two primary kinds of AI. So we have artificial intelligence, um, A or AGI, and artificial narrow intelligence, or ANI. And this is where the important distinction lies because the average person who, when faced with the question, what do you think AAS is, it invariably respond with an answer that invokes HAL 9000 or Commander Data. So um, HAL Commander Data um, is an artificial fictional um, character that it's a thousand one movie. So if you search on HAL, HAL 9000, um, you're gonna see it's a fictional artificial intelligence uh, during 2001. Okay, so let's proceed. Uh, so we'll discuss what the field of AI. So let's discuss what is AGI. AGI is a general intelligence that does embrace the spirit of the famous science fiction machines like HAL and data machines that can reason and think like a human. But it's probably better to say that AGI references machines that are as intelligent or more intelligent than humans. I'll get into reasoning and thinking later, but let's generalize the term Intelligence for the moment is having the ability to make decisions when faced with problems. So when faced with problems regardless of their complexity, ANI, narrow intelligence, on the other hand, oh yes. So NI, narrow intelligence, on the other hand, that refers to the machines that are designed to perform specific tasks like recognize a language or drive a car. So if you had any experience with computers, programming, encryption, or AI, you'll be familiar with the name Alan Turing. Considered by many to be the father of modern computing, cryptanalysis is an AI. Turing posited the idea of a test famously known as the Turing test. The idea of the test is to create a scenario where one proves a machine is intelligent in the sense that humans are intelligent by having the machine. A, a human as a comparator, B, and a C, asking A and B questions. The interrogator is behind the wall or divider and can see A or B. And if, and if the interrogator cannot determine which is human and which is machine, then we can assume that the machine is intelligent. There is more to test than that, and it's more involved than simply asking questions. For example, the machine has to convince the interrogator it's human, so the visual perception and palette factors have to be replicated. But what's remarkable is that Alan Turing test is relevant today. Six, seven years after he invented it, we're still talking about it and still remains the standard for determining AI. So general AI is usually what people think of when talking about AI for a couple of reasons. First, intelligence is machines. That is, machines that can think like humans is a goal to unto itself. Narrow AI can be used for many purposes like parsing a sentence in English or recognizing a face. But a combination of all the narrow aspects of AI lead to an end goal of creating machines that act and think like humans. Second, 
General AI tends to partner more interest in the public domain anyway. It's a stuff found in sci-fi novels, movies, TV shows, a type of interesting thing. It's interesting, it's controversial, it spurs heated debates and inspires a broad range of disciplines. Computer science, philosophy, mathematics, linguistics, engineering, neuroscience, and even economics. General AI involves the direct influence of and in development of several key abilities. Reasoning, the thing that makes us consider factors and develop conclusions, representing knowledge, drawing upon previous conclusions, and using that experience to form new ones. Planning, makes strategic choices based on what we know and what we think. Learning from experiences, storing our success and failures, and using those to form responses for future challenges. And processing natural languages, hearing and understanding language in a way that lets us formulate ideas and responses. In AI theory and practice, one term you'll frequently come across with is the term intelligent agent. It's at the core of AI research and implementation. So what, what is an intelligent agent, by the way? Well, it's an intelligent entity living in any environment. And while that may sound a bit daunting, it helps you think of an agent as anything that does something as a response to a stimulus or some sort of predetermined command. A thermostat, for example, is an intelligent agent. It takes rational actions based on perception. Thermostats, even the older ones that use bimetallic strips instead of modern heat sensors, are told to activate a heating mechanism when the temperature drops below a certain level. And it deactivates the heat when the desired purple program temperature has been achieved. So intelligent agents use sensors that trigger when a condition is met and then fires actuators. Uh, so this in diagram demonstrates how the agent acts with an environment to draw perception or observations from the environment through sensors and then use the actuators to act on the environment. They can receive uh, essentially anything used to take information in the act and upon that information. They can be quite simple like a basic thermostat or quite complex like the agents that use in the modern application of artificial intelligence. Alright, so our next topic is fields and applications of AI. So in this video, um, I will describe some of the fields in artificial intelligence research and their per applications. So AI is a popular field to be in. It impacts virtually every industry and ultimately every person that interacts with artificial intelligence, which is most of the world today. So if you call your bank and interact with an automated phone system that uses commands, if you use a fingerprint reader or a camera to log in your PC or phone, even a Google search with an autofill predictions based on your typing, use some pretty sophisticated AI. But you might be surprised at the number of disciplines that have a stake in AI research. Like for example, philosophy is constantly challenged with questions like what constitutes knowledge and how can thought process be defined in a series of steps, or those that can be programmed. So psychology in can be interested in determining um, interested in determining how creature humans and other animals for thought processes and actions from thought processes. So in economics, um, concern itself with determining the best way to make decisions in order to maximize benefit and to how to act independently in the concert within or in spite of others. So in mathematics, it focuses on turning um, decision processes into rules and computations that will result um, in accurate, uh, inaccurate results. So it deals with certain uncertainty, a tricky issue that presents a significant problem in the creation of AI. Um, so yeah, uh, we'll deal with um, what is um, a... So in computer engineering, of course, it has a great focus on AI from building the actual machines, but more than that, uh, making efficient machines that can leverage on the code that goes in the AI. And to implement it with mechanisms like visual systems, robotics, for example, um, 
and those are in the field of computer engineering. And then also we have a neuroscience. So for neuroscience, uh, it needs to understand how a human brain accepts, processes, and reacts to stimuli on a neurological level. So in AI, um, it can still play a part on how it is used. So there's still a way that AI can be used in neuroscience or in how the brain functions or replicating what does a human mind do with uh, Alright, <clears throat> so we also have dictionary for AI. We, when we parse meeting, for example, we want to parse meeting and we have sentiment analysis, we can use the uh, artificial. So we have AI applications that are used today, and there's an example like the gameplay, the chess. So this Modern gameplay um, and uh, games like Tic Tac Toe and Triggers were good choices for computer games because they are relatively simple to program and it didn't require sophisticated processing on the part of computer. But the chess has been a popular choice, and because it's a very strategic game with a massive amount of possible outcomes, it was well known. So it was quite tempting for programmers to demonstrate that computers could do with chess and the earliest chess match between a human and a computer occurred in 1956 at Los Alamos Lab. So the computer won in 23 moves but it's important to know that it was playing an amateur. Since then, there have been a number of notable human <coughs> computer chess matches but none of... <coughs> excuse me. So Gary Kasparov and IBM supercomputer Big Blue, they played two six game matches and while Kasparov beat Big Blue four games into two in 1996, Big Blue edged out Kasparov in the 1997 rematch. So the matches were notable because the general public, they suggested that AI wasn't simply a cute idea anymore. Although in truth, AI had been a serious science and a looming reality for a long time. Voice interfaces like Alexa, Siri, Cortana, and Google's voice-activated AI are popular and quickly growing applications of artificial intelligence. This allow users to questions and engage with computer intelligence. So we have Simi Simi um, example. Self-driving and autonomous cars um, are also an example. <coughs> and there have been around the, those research for self-driving cars around 1920s. So. The first successful Tesla self-driving car in public traffic is in 2013. Now today, major automotive companies are creating autonomous cars. If you heard about Dundee car, <laughs> then you'll know, know about the self-driving car. So robotics is actually another part or popular application of AI. We have robotics process automation that, that with robots, we use either use of automating processes, especially in manufacturing facilities. Excuse me. So they used human um, actually to work to do the, the process. So other application of AI include logistics, um, planning and determining um, logistics planning, um, determining the best use of resources and routes. For example, utilizing map systems in conjunction with GPS to determine the best route for delivery trucks and identify construction zones or traffic jams in routing. And U.S. military used an AI-based planning system during the Gulf War to deal with thousands of resources that needed to be planned and routed. Machine learning, the study and development of machines that learn and improve themselves became a field unto itself, evolving out of AI research. And healthcare is another field where AI has taken deep roots. Using expert system for diagnosis and robots that can assist in surgeries providing precision and greater control. So that ends the topic for fields and application. Next topic is AI techniques.
So in this topic, I'll describe some of the techniques that used to build artificial intelligence systems. Um, there are some common techniques in developing artificial intelligence, and when you're fi familiarizing yourself with methodology for AI, these are a good place to start. First and foremost, um, searching algorithms are a key way to build our intelligence system because AI needs to draw from database, often quite large ones or goals, solution parameters, rules, and perhaps even other key of information. Searches need to be optimized for several reasons. First, the information must be in search to be exhaustive and not practical in system, and that need to optimize their decision-making process. A simple search is simply too slow and efficient. Okay, so for A asterisk search algorithm is a popular and efficient programming method used in advanced path searches. And in the popular search, because it's fast and accurate, optimization in a mathematical sense is also a useful technique because it begins in a search with a guess already positive, refining the guess until all options have been exhausted. These are often referred to as a hill climbing and a gradient descent algorithms because they can visually represent and taking incremental steps as in Hopkins Hill or in steps of a gradient probably. Probability theory theory deals with the simple understanding that AI often works with little or no information to begin. So several tools have been used that AI programmers leverage in the decision-making process. So we have the markup decision process, for example, is a method used to map probability based on steps in the process, relying only upon the current state of a step to determine outcomes. So for example, during the markup decision process, only the current step will be used to determine probability for future steps. Of course, each step before it got there in the same way. And next, Next, there is logic which is used for problem solving as well as other goals like planning. For example, basically logic is used to for inference, drawing a conclusion based on the state of various parameters and for representing knowledge that is coming to conclusions and even learning. There are several common methods for performing logic such as true-false logic, known as a propositional logic, first-order logic or fuzzy logic, subjective logic, and more. Um, I won't let them explain all of this except to say that they typically use some form of true or false or boolean determination with options to characterize objects, properties, relationships, and more by isolating or quantifying them. Statistics also plays a larger role in AI. One method used to train classifications, the other common method through machine learning. Classification is the best process of defining a thing. The pen is blue, for example. Classification or classifiers are kind of AI algorithm, the being controllers. In the pen example, a classifier determines that the pen is blue, and a controller would perform an action, for example, to drop the pen. Neural networks were eventually developed before the artificial intelligence research began. And as the name suggests, they're based on the neural model of the brain, with interconnected nodes representing neurons. The interest in neural network is based on the premise that if the human brain's decision learning processes should be replicated in a computer, then the processes could be mimicked. And while early neural networks were impractical because they were slow, um, the modern computer processing ex exponentially um, go faster than the computers in the 1960s and 70s. So today's Neural uh, networks use a layered approach to the neural paradigm. <coughs> and so, <coughs> uh, so like Google and Apple, they have a leveraged form of the neural networks that called long short term memory for all kinds of enhanced tasks like speech recognition and language. If you notice, Google can recognize your voice and have saved searches. Other AI techniques that we considered, including your programming language, commonly used in the development of AI. So primary list and prologue, which were both created with AI development in mind, um, list is actually the second oldest high-level programming language and was introduced in 1959. Prolog was introduced in the 1970s and is a declarative language based on rules and relationships. 
So for machine learning is a term that refers to the field that focuses on machines that can improve their programming using techniques such as reinforced learning. So Q-learning is such a system uh, providing rules and preferments for decisions made and creating policies based on those rules. Finally, we have natural language processing is an important also field of AI research and development that focuses on the language is interpreted. Okay, that may be sounds relatively simple. Human languages are numerous and quite complex in their syntaxes, but even systems that need to analyze written rather than spoken language involve complex coding that determines meaning use using large libraries of information. So. Processing semantics, um, the field of concern with meaning, continues to get faster, however, as computer processing power increases. Okay, that ends our, our topic for AI techniques. Our next topic is defining agents. <clears throat> so in this video, I'll discuss intelligent agents, understanding intelligent agents are important part of understanding the field of ai so what are they uh well the definition of an intelligent agent is an entity that lives in an environment that uses sensors to build a percept or uses actors to interact with the environment now while that may sound pretty intimidating the short definition is a bit friendlier um an intelligent agent by definition is anything that waits for some sort of external stimulus to an input and then acts upon the stimulus to an output <coughs> yeah it interacts with in the environment so this diagram describes the basic functionality of an intelligent agent um the term percepts refers to an agent's current perception of the environment Using sensors, for example, it can measure the state of the environment. Sensors could be anything that measures something. So a um, metallic strip um, in a thermostat, a barometer for measuring atmospheric pressure, a sonic sensor, a touch sensor, a proximity sensor, and a stiff sensor. So you name it. <coughs> it measures something often in digital manner. So that means it can be trained to detect a state in an environment. So detecting if an audio levels increase past a certain number of decibels, for example, the agent that acts based on triggered events, turning down the volume to an acceptable level to use by... To use. So it's a basic example. Agents have multiple actions, often sequence that they have to activate. But more than that, percepts can have stored sequence, that is, an agent's percepts history. Every audio level are ever recorded by the percept, for example, that means that a percept can be used to train a system how to act over time based on that history. Learning in other words, and that leads to rational agents. As the name suggests, indicates, rational agents are agents that act rationally, doing the right thing by taking actions to maximize performance, operating more efficiently over time as they store more data in their histories. But how do we tell the agent what the right thing to do? Well, we use performance measures. Agents perform actions based on their percepts, and those actions create an end state. Turn down the volume. Keep in mind that we focus on the state of environment, not the agent because it's the environment state that's important. We don't want the agent deciding how good a job it's doing. So the agent can be used to determine how desirable that end state and is the volume that unacceptable level. The performance measures capture those determinations used to grade an agent on how well it's done and the more time that has passed, the more information can be used to generate performance measures, meaning that agents can be better over time virtue of their learning behavior. Okay, that ends my uh, third module, Defining Agents. Next topic is Types of Agent. So in this topic, um, I'll discuss the different types of intelligent systems or intelligence agents that are any mechanism, if you will, that wait for a condition or a series of conditions to meet. And what happens act upon an environment? <clears throat> for example, a thermostat will activate heat when it senses the temperature has dropped below a set level. In the field of AI, the sensor is referred to as a first step and the mechanism that provides the action and actuator and a code that maps 
The relationship between the percept and actuator is called an agent program. In simple programming terms, there is an input in the percept and an output to the actuator with a program in the middle determining whether the conditions have been met and whether to fire the actuator. There are several different types of agents and used in intelligence systems. So let's take a look. Um, we have simple reflex agents. That's, it's simple in the fact that the simplest of the agents. So for simple reflex agents, it only uses the current state of the environment. So in other words, they don't care about the past states or any history that might provide a pattern. So in this diagram, the environment provides input to the first step and acts on the environment or it doesn't based on what is occurring right now. So my example of this is a good, a simple reflex is a thermostat. <clears throat> so on the second one is a model-based agent that require more information to function. They use um, external inputs from the environment. They also depend on a set of rules of observation as well understanding past of actions or history of previous actuators and their results. So it's the opposite of the first one. Mm -hmm. And also, uh, they have rules themselves and include considerations that aren't necessarily observable, things that make the world work. And they can do include the agent program making assumptions without having directly observable stimuli. So, for example, we have a speech recognition system that understand English might be programmed to assume that the user's first language may not be English and therefore the user may, be, may have an accent. <coughs> so in the model-based agent would not be able to determine what language that there was. The humans can often detect a person's language based on their accent. But it doesn't matter to the, to the agent. It only has to assume that this person might have an accent and guess that what it sounds. Perhaps even draw a library that takes into account of a certain pronunciations. So in model agent, um, on the other hand, the goal-based agent, it takes the model-based approach a step further. So it's an um, enhanced version of the model-based. Um, that's why there are goals because they works in a binary state. That is, there are often more to the, more than two choices. GPS is a good example. For example, what if there are multiple routes? The goal-based agent has to determine all the turns when creating a route. So it has to ask what happens if I choose the right turn instead of the left turn. So an example of a goal-based uh, agent is a GPS system.
different in mind that programming utility um, uh, can be extremely complex and difficult. For learning agents, there are uh, things all together and it's pretty obvious just by looking at the model, the ultimate goal of AI is to build rational systems that learn and self-improve. So when I speak of learning in the previous models, I'm really speaking about a rudimentary ability to use past actions as a way of improving new actions. Um, <clears throat> so, wait. Uh, let me pause this video and play it again. So, the learning agent is a popular model that are frequently used in modern design AI. So let me pause the video <coughs> and play it again. So the critic acts as a grader using a set criteria to let the agent know how well it does in its choices and it also modifies the performance element to make better choices in the future. So the problem generator is interesting because it suggests different ways of doing things in the hopes of finding newer and better ways of operating. So in other words, does it let the performance element have its way every time? Which makes sense because the performance elements only focus on different best known method. So it doesn't concern itself with question, is there a way to better do this? So our next um, topic we will describe agents or describe environment in uh, the agent. I think we're good. So in this topic, um, this task environment in which intelligent agents live. So intelligent agents are only intelligent in the context of their environment and the tasks that they need to perform. So in other words, an agent for playing chess can understand the rules, <clears throat> the way places can move, and what constitutes a win. But it's really intelligent if it understands how to react to other players' moves, which strategies and tactics should be used, and so on. And if you take all of the necessary components of playing a chess match, that's the task environment, components of the problem, and that the agent requires to play chess. The task environment can be broken into four categories known as EEAS, and this all have to be properly populated to design an intelligent agent. So P stands for performance, uh, measures and goals of the agent, environment, the external environment that the agent will be interacting with and acting upon, and A, actuators, the mechanism that perform actions on the external environment, and S, the sensors input needed in order to understand the external environment. So here's an example of EAS using the chest plane agent example. Um, under performance, there are two basic conditions for continuing or ending a chess game. Have I won it? And do I still have my king? Meaning I haven't lost. I suppose you could add a third measure here to account for a draw. Under environment, you will have a chess board and a basis, a game clock, and of course an opponent. Actuators, if it's a physical game, played with a physical board and basis, would include some Way to move the pieces so robotics or if a computer based game you will have output representing the board and even a speaker if the agent is particularly evil and wants to talk in an exponent. Finally, under sensors a physical board would likely need a camera so the agent can see it and the computer game would have a keyboard and screen to moves. Alright, so that uh, ends our describing environment module. Uh, topic and then we'll proceed with the environment's observability. So in this video, um in the next video, I'll discuss the difference between an observable and partially observable and an observable environment and describe this, how does it affect agents. <coughs> okay, so understanding the environment in which an agent operates is not always as simple as it sounds. Um, environment can mean many things and sometimes not everything is observable. In observable environments, however, an agent sees everything in the environment at all times. In such an environment, it becomes easy to build a mental model 
meaning the agent does not need any information other than what it immediately observed. An example of this is chess match. The chess playing agent needs to see the board and all the pieces both of the agent and its opponent. Because that's the only way it will be able to effectively play the chess. In image analysis agent, the agent needs to be able to see an image in order to analyze it. For example, if the agent's task is to digitize a face from a printed photograph and the face on the photograph is partially obfuscated because there's a book sitting on half the face. And that you detect the face. So there's a partially observable environment. Like for example, the photo half covered by a book. In such an environment, an agent must build a mental model. For example, understanding the shape of the entire sh a face, the shape of the mouth, that there are two eyes and two nostrils, and so on. So in this scenario, it may be possible for the agent to reliably construct the face with only half the information. So, other example like poker, where an agent cannot see the cards of opposing players. The Mars rover, which needs to navigate the terrain, but can only observe part of that terrain. Or a maze-solving robot that can only observe the area of the maze that is currently residing. So, an observable environment are, as the name suggests, completely unavailable to an agent. The agent has no information about the environment, perhaps, because it has no sensors to detect the environment. This isn't an alpha as it sounds, but the methods such as local search algorithms, which search only local and ad adjoining nodes, it can be used to define solutions. Examples of this are might include optimizing problems, where an agent doesn't know what should be done in order to optimize a node in a tree or being inside a heavy storm where there is no zero visibility. Alright, so that ends our environment's observability. Topic. So that's pretty to the next one, number of agents and the environment. So in this video, I'll discuss the number of agents in a given environment that can affect the problem-solving process. <clears throat> so AI agents rely on the task-based environments, but the sheer scope of the kinds of tasks that can be implemented can be overwhelming. Fortunately, there are boundaries or parameters that you can use to narrow and define pretty much any task. Once you define those parameters, then you can decide what methods to use and how to create an agent. Determining the number of agents and how they interact in a good place, is, uh, in a single agent environment, um, the agent must perform a task by itself and only consider the task at hand. So an example of this would be an agent task with solving Sudoku puzzles. So another example is an agent tasked with controlling a production time. But example would be a narrow scope because you want to factor many aspects of a production line, it quickly becomes complex and multifaceted and likely a multi-agent task. So let's say you have an agent that has a monitor, the completed products coming off the production line, simply assuring that they are complete and flowing off the line in a steady manner. In a cooperative multi-agent environment, agents must work with other agents to achieve their goals. For example, self-driving cars that help interact with other cars that act as agents. Even if those are cars are in intelligence, they still act as them. Because they move, they change lanes, and an intelligent agent must, by its programming, navigate safely on a road. And all other cars need to do the same, driven by humans or not. So a soccer match is another good example of a cooperative multi-agent environment. <coughs> so um, another example is competitive multi-agent environment. These are where there are many agents working in a naturally competitive environment, meaning there are agents that are encouraged to perform better than other agents. So there are benefits performing better, and a good example of this is a chess match, uh, where it's an agent benefit performed better than its opponent. So a soccer match is also a good example of a competitive environment because a, every player benefits from being an effective than the others. Okay, so this ends the topic for um, number of agents and environments. So certainty and environment is our next topic. So in this the video, I'll discuss deterministic and stochastic environment and how the level of certainty in an environment affects agents. So for stochastic environments, these are environments with a level of uncertainty. 
chance if you will in other words the environment isn't deterministic so regardless of the state of the environment or agent there's a variability at play that can keep the scales of the outcome so example of st stochastic environments include dice game where there's no certainty over how a role of device will result so poker which relies on the randomization of playing cards is also an example so driving cars because they don't know what's around the corner and the environment of a highway filled with cars is naturally chaotic, changing constantly unpredictable. So on the other hand, the deterministic environment is the counter to the stochastic environment. So in such environments, agents have complete control over the environment's outcome. Because there are no variables, everything is fixed. Example of this is chess. Because there is an astronomical number of possible outcomes in the chess, the number is approximately 10 to the power of 120. Still infinite number, meaning even though a player seems can appear to be uncertain in the context of what you observe, it's not true randomness, there's still an observable environment and a fixed number of possibilities. Image analysis is also an example of a deterministic environment where the agent can see image in its entirety. There's no uncertainty, at least in the context of the pixels being processed. So obviously, deterministic environments are much easier to navigate and uncertainty is much more difficult. So in understatement to say that uncertainty comes with challenges. So describing every possible outcome can be extremely difficult to compute. So even poker has over 2.5 million possible hands and goes simply, um, <coughs> so additionally, how do you quantify a risk? In order to create an agent, uh, that operates in an environment, there has to be something quantifiable, some measurable number that determines the agent's choices. With what, with that, it comes an inevitable question in the context of your agent. Are you risky? Do you have a problem agent that take risk? Remembering that we first need to quantify the risk. Well, in a poker match, absolutely, you have no choice but to be risky. Because you don't ever know what the cards the other players are holding. If you're not all that risky, then you don't fold after every deal. So, which in turn defeats the purpose of playing the poker. So, you bet, you decide on what your current hand could possibly be. And that discards some cards in the hopes that you'll get the ones that make your hand a winner. So, po poker is inherently risky. What if it plan fails? They routinely do. In the other poker example, what if you get a new draw and you're still left with a lousy hand? Do you fold? Do you choose to bluff in the hopes that you can fold other players? These are all considerations when undertaking uncertainty and they play a significant role in the field of artificial intelligence. So this ends um, the topic for our certainty in an environment. Next topic is environment's behavior. So in this topic, I'll discuss different types of environmental behavior and how it can affect agents. <coughs> so we have developing intelligent agents that involve working with the environment. So when we talk about environment behavior, there are ways that we can generalize and categorize their behavior. This allows us to choose the right agent for the job first. We have episodic versus sequential environment. In episodic environments, states aren't connected, so different states are self-contained and there's no consideration given to other states. There's a single trigger and a single action. Actions undertaken by an agent only affect individual states or episodes, which is why we refer to this as episodic states. Example of this is include classification, a task that requires you to take one item, you classify it, then you move it to the next item. So another example is image analysis. When an image analysis agent is analyzed in a single image, it's not thinking about the image before it and the other one. So in sequential environment, there's a connection between states, which states affect the others. Example of this environment include chess where um, there is a critical strategy. So, um, another example of this is self-driving um, cars, having a sequential environment to deal with. So, Our other cars are moving, which ones are speeding up and slowing down, so which ones are changing lanes, so this is sequential. Um, 
static and dynamic environments affect how an agent must react. So in static environment, the environment doesn't change while the agent makes decision, redu reducing the need to make quick decision. Example is the chess match where there's no game clock or solving a puzzle. So in dynamic environment, on the other hand, is the environment changes while the agents make decisions. So meaning, um, you continuously make decisions, and a good example of this is self-driving cars, uh, which you have constantly review the environment and react. And the video games where situations change based on the actions of the player. So we have semi-dynamic environments, um, or static environments where performance change over time. So like dynamic environments, agents need to make quick decisions, and examples would be chess with the clock. Uh, where an agent has a limited amount of time to move. And other um, examples, puzzle solving, where speed is often a metric by which you are graded. So finally, there's a discrete and continuous environment. So in discrete environment, there's a finite number of sta finite state of number of states in action. So um, examples, you move states to different states instantly. Include this is the chess with a clock and a poker because both examples there's a predefined number of outcomes and moves are constant determined gameplay and in continuous state on the other hand there's an infinite number of states between actions are continuous through state also self-driving cars is also a continuous state mm -hmm. so that's an example of a continuous state Uh, so that concludes our um, environments behavior topic module. So our next is describing an agent in an environment. It's time for us to put some of that knowledge to work. So this is exercise, you'll define the performance environment in actuators and sensors for a checker's agent environment. Okay, so be remind you that this will be part of uh, the quiz so let's perform the task um if you do not know exactly what to do so let's look at the performance environment of tweeters and sensor for a checkers game which is PEAS so we have a table displayed it contains five columns and one row there is one header for the first column the remaining four column headers are performance environment actuators and sensors um, the row header is checkers player so for a checkers player under performance you have have I won the game? Then that's the end goal for the checkers. In the environment, you have things like the game board, the game pieces, and the opponents, assuming a physical board. So, for under sensors, you have camera to review the board. So, let's find the properties for checkers agents. So, the agent is the checkers player. Now, as far as observability goes, it fully observed because the board and the pieces can and must be seen by the chess playing agent. As far as fast a single multiple agents, this is a multiple agent scenario because there are two players. Both players could be computer players or one could be the computer and the one could be a human being. As far as whether it's deterministic or stochastic, it's determined because there's a finite amount of moves in the checkers. So for epidemic versus sequential, it's sequential because the state aren't connected. But what you did in the last move, it isn't going to affect what you do in your next move. As far as whether it's a static or dynamic environment, it's a static environment because the environment has changed during the decision-making process. Because until you make actually your move, the board remains static. The pieces all stay in place. As far as whether it's discrete or continuous, it's discrete because the action instantly changed in the state of the game. As you move a piece or the opponent moves a piece, the state of the game has changed. I hope you found this exercise useful. Alright, so do you have any questions that ends our module for introduction of artificial intelligence?